traditions learned from the stories of the past. E koutou e te matapōrehu, koutou kua kapia nei e aitū kikini. Nā koutou te ara i whakatakotoria hei hikoinga mō mātou ngā uri. Tēnei koutou te tikina atu anō e mātou, te whakairihia ki te taumato o te whakaaro, ki te tihi o maumahara. Mei kore koutou te rau te tangihā ngurunguru noa. Kā tira i tēnei, oki oki mai rā koutou ki te āhuru wāhingaro. E moe, moe mai rā. Kia tahuri ake ki a tātou, ngā uru pā o rātou, kua momotu i te here ngā tangata, tēnā rā tātou katoa. Nei rā te mihi kawake, ki oku rangatira, ki oku tapairu. Mo ngō koutou whakaaro, me ngō koutou wheako, e toko ake ai, hei horanga mō mātou te hunga mātakitaki, te hunga whakarongo. Nō te ngākaua mihi aroha ka rere atu ki a koutou te nā koutou, te nā koutou, te nā koutou katoa. E te iwi, no mai, whakatau mai, and welcome to this presentation on traditional forms of Māori learning and Māori oral histories. The beautiful accounts you will hear are taken from the experiences and thoughts of some of our renowned Māori leaders of today, and we are truly indebted to them all for allowing us the opportunity to share in their experiences. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the following stories. Modi ora. The Three Baskets of Knowledge. According to um, Tainui, uh, Tafaki was the uh, mythical ancestor that uh, climbed the pathway the seven heavens to acquire the, the, the three baskets of knowledge from Io, Io Matuakore. Ironically enough, um, as I read the story, the, the, the Purako, the myth of Tafaki travelling to the twelfth heaven, I, I remembered another um, myth that I had read when as a young child and it was about the man who climbed the, the beanstalk, Jack and the beanstalk. Now that might seem stupid, but you know, that's the principle. Because the beanstalk had the, the leaves, as it were, going out, and, and Tawhaki and Tane were told, you know, if they grasped those, those branches, they were to make sure that they were to grasp the ones that were attached to the main trunk. And that's exactly what Tawhaki was told to do. Purely coincidental, I know. Tawhaki uh, climbed to the highest heavens, mm -hmm. uh, not along a staircase, mm -hmm. as we, we have a, another tradition of Tāne Mahuta following that staircase. Tāne climbed the Aka. Mm -hmm. Uh, a vine, and he didn't climb the vine, <laughs> he climbed the vine spiralling his way up. Okay. Now, in, in, in spiralling his way up this vine, uh, he would come to a node in the vine and there would be a tupua, or an atua there, who would test him. And in that, in that testing, if he passed the test, then he continued. And if he didn't pass it, then he'd have, have to find another pathway yeah. to get up there, get up there. right? Mm -hmm. And then when he um, when he did reach the uh, reach the highest heaven, he went to this being called Rehua, mm -hmm. who gave him the, the baskets of knowledge, okay. and he also gave Tafaki the stones, what we call the stones of consolidation. Mm -hmm. 
One of those stones was the stone of formality, and the other stone was the stone of informality. Besides the three baskets of knowledge, he also brought back two pebbles, two stones, and their names were Hukatai and Rehutai, sea spray and sea foam. And so uh, they came back and they came to mankind. They were here to be utilised by mankind in whatever way. And so, firstly, let me talk about the three baskets of knowledge. When we, when we hear and when we see, the assumption is that, oh, all the learning in the world is what these baskets hold. The first basket is the basket of ritual and incantation. What on earth is that? That's about prayers, karakia, and it is about the method of, that we know today of going into meditation and chanting and, and literally praying. So that's the first basket. Praying at all times for safety, for good health. Uh, the second basket was the basket of good. Everything that's good in this world was the second basket. And the third basket is the basket of evil. Now what on earth does that mean? Because mankind is made up of good and bad. And the basket, the first basket, ritual and incantation and karakia, is the basket that helps us to keep out of evil and back into good. So that's the, that's the picture of the three baskets and it makes sense. The word wananga means knowledge. Mm. That's all it is. Mm. And the whare is a, a house where knowledge is shared and taught. If I understand a wananga, its principle is in terms of reflection. Mm. Its principles are in terms of understanding what is going on around one and then using those understandings mm. to further the aspirations of those to whom the person belongs. Mm. Right? If we take out the word whare and look at the word wānanga, we find that um, it is used in two contexts. When it's used as a noun, it refers to the house that um, teaching of sacred knowledge was practised in. When used as a verb, the word wānanga means to debate and deliberate. And so um, wānanga wasn't just about learning, it was also about asking questions, debating and deliberating so that the student or the persons within that whare wānanga were conversant with what it was that they were being taught. Right from the very beginning of this idea of education and learning in our Tainui traditions, there's an understanding that you learn just as much and just as importantly informally mm. as you do formally. Okay. So the kitchen of your house is a wānan. Yeah. Right? The back of the marae mm. is just as much a wānanga as the front of the marae. Mm. Uh, the other aspect of this is that people will bring certain skills and it's not just one person doing the teaching. It's a, it's a group mm. wānanga. I think whare wānanga is a symbolic as well as a physical uh, representation of uh, knowledge. Mm. Um, there is a house of course, there were houses in the past, I believe, although I never ever saw mm. them or came into contact, but of course for me a whare wānanga is a symbolic uh, form of learning. Mm. And of course included in that um, are all the types of uh, learning that uh, one um, captures over the years. Mm. Uh, the whare tapu mm. of uh, Ngāpuhi, of the northern people, they're from the mountains. Mm. 
and that creates their whare wāmanga mm. of learning. Yeah. The different yeah. mountains, which is part of their whakatauhi, their proverb, creates within it their own yeah. house of learning, yeah. their whare wāmanga. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's physical, yeah. but mm. it's also environmental. Yeah. If we come down now to um, to where um, I understand Farewananga became important was when the canoes arrived in New Zealand, possibly around 1350. And the first, of course, was the Farewananga that uh, Hotiroa and Rakatoura, the captain and the tohunga of the Tainuiwaka, set up at Kafia, and they named Ahure. And it was there that um, those, no, those sacred knowledge, sacred knowledge is about um, knowledge that, is, uh, that comes from the uh, kowairunga or the upper dimension, the celestial world. And these were taught in the Farewana. The learning of esoteric knowledge mm. or what we call te kauwairunga, that knowledge that's traditionally displayed on the, mm. uh, the back wall of the whare nui, um, was specifically reserved for those who had mana mm. in their own way because of their whakapapa. I have this thesis that yes, there were times when, when uh, people were brought into an enclosed space and, and it may not necessarily have been a whare. Mm. And this space uh, was special mm. and it was given a, a, a mana mm. and the people who worked there carried that mana. Yeah. So, so these spaces that you speak of, um, so were there certain places that were selected as, as the, um, oh, as we can say, the perfect place to deliver these wānanga? Wānanga took place throughout. Mm. Mm. I don't believe that there was a special place oh, okay. to to wānanga mm. something, yeah. right? but in terms of the, the understanding of uh, the depth mm. of tapu mm. and the, the, the ideas of Modi, yeah. you know, the the, um, the kuda mm. um, involved in that, uh, especially esoteric yeah. knowledges, mm. then they would in all probability be associated with a place. Yeah. Right? The whare wānanga was, n was not just a set aside. Yeah. The whare wānanga could be a building just like this. Mm. And then it would be used at a certain time of the day or the night mm. for, uh, and I think when you've got these uh, chiefs' sons and and uh, uh, you got those learned young people, those mm. good uh, memorizing young mm. people. Uh, they would have it for their time because, you see, the most important part in those, that kind of school mm. was to do with the gods. Their whakapapa, mm. uh, from Io right down uh, to uh, the people themselves. Mm. Those were the two important things, the whakapapa of the gods, the whakapapa of the people. Mm. Then this building again could be set aside and maybe tomorrow for things to do with agriculture, another okay. class of school. Mm. But that, that class of school, uh, agriculture, uh, warfare and all that was separate again. Mm. It wasn't as sort of uh, sacred, sacred in as this one yes. uh, mm. to do with the gods and to do with yeah. genealogy mm. and the history of the people. So the purpose of the whare wānanga was to teach those areas of the sacred knowledge. The uh, knowledge of education, for want of a better word, was taught um, in and around the marae. It was more a physical way of teaching the, the, the young people. That is the, the terrestrial knowledge which looked at survival. Uh, survival was about being able to fish, being able to go out and, um, and snare birds and knowing how to preserve them, knowing how to collect the flax and weave garments. Um, that was applicable to the terrestrial world. But what we're talking about here, of course, is those that pertain to the 
celestial world. The teachers were mainly those elders who were steeped in the esoteric, you know, that's the, uh, the, the Taha Wairua, mm -hmm. and, and also in the, uh, the tribal histories and whakapapa and, and genealogies of the present. And uh, so they were always identified and they were teachers. And the teachers, there were a number of them around the country, but uh, I want to just pull mine back to uh, my knowledge to uh, Tainui and where my father-in-law, Te Kani Te Ua, who was the son-in-law of Sir Apia Nangata, and he was the, their uh, teachers. They had three teachers. And, and uh, the three teachers were steeped uh, in, uh, first of all, things to do with the heavens, with, with Eo, mm. that sacred name, Eo. Mm. And then all the departmental gods that came with that, of which Tafiri Mate is one, Tumatoinga is another one, uh, uh, Tane Mahuta is another, you know, there was a whole lot. There were 70 gods. Mm. And, uh, and these fellas all had a knowledge of those 70 gods and the relationship of those 70 gods to the social, the cultural, the spiritual uh, side of human life. Because you had the learner, you know, still learning. You had the tohunga, who uh, knew a lot. And of course, you had the one, you know, the, the, the elder, the tupuna that was right up there. And he was what you would call the professor, I suppose. Yeah. Um, whereas, uh, uh, and I think they still had those levels, but they weren't termed in such a way mm -hmm. that people were um, uh, were excluded from the upper level and so forth. I think people knew mm -hmm. that they were still learning, and others knew that they were at a certain level. And so, it was, an, to me, it was an accepted thing that so and so knew had all the knowledge about karakia, for example, mm -hmm. and uh, someone else had the knowledge uh, and the experience and the right rituals for karanga, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. The choice of the students came from the very, shall I dare say, the elite in terms of genealogy, whakapapa, chosen carefully from the tribe and trained from possibly um, autumn onwards in the in the meeting houses, in the in the Farewananga houses, day after day, night after night, for uh, some three months at a time. Uh, so if they started off when they were young, six, seven year olds, they probably didn't come out of there till they were 17. By then, because it was the rote learning method, uh, they were, they could quote, and I suppose this is where the word oral comes in, oral tradition, because they were able to quote oral tradition, almost parrot fashion. Now they also believed in it, of course, it was their history, it was their rituals and incantations, and after being chosen and, and coming out, they of course um, became the tohunga of each sub-tribe hapu. And that was the spiritual safety of that particular tribe, which was something uh, maori and practiced at that time, both physical and spiritual. They were chosen mm. to be the leaders of the future of their people. They were chosen to be the caretakers of the history of the people. They were chosen because they were able to, to retain exactly what the tutors gave them and they need to share that exactly with the people. These students who came into that kura, mm. they had already been uh, earmarked by the people. The majority of those young people, students who came in there, were either the, the sons of the chiefs, whose it was important that they learned 
the, the, not only the, the godly history, but the tribal history, so that there was a continuity of life in that tribe. Mm. Now that was very, very important. And therefore, and, and at the same time, in that uh, learning, you could not make a mistake. Mm. To make one mistake according to Henare Tu Whangai, mm. uh, death was the, uh, the end result. Mm. And people went in, uh, those young people who were chosen to be uh, students, now they, they went in at the age, about age 12. Mm. And there were those also who were identified as having good memory um, in that they were noticed, say, over a period of a month. You tell them something, the next day you, you, you repeat the question, they can give you an answer. They remembered exactly what you, so they would be chosen to be a student. My understanding of the traditional whare wānanga was that there, was, there were people who were, who were identified mm -hmm. that would carry out particular tasks. Mm -hmm. And that was, for my understanding, it's primarily based on potentially their lineage or their mm. whakapapa, mm. Uh, also yeah. their innate talents, mm. um, their portrayal of particular skills and abilities, yeah. be it creative, be it um, other, mm. and then they were identified particular roles, things like fai kōrero or speech, yeah. um, karanga or doing the, the woman doing the calls, mm. traditional calls, whakapapa or yeah. ability to uh, Memorize and to be able to carry um, with with a huge high level of accuracy mm. the lineage in terms of genealogy yeah. of people through the Papa, mm. through to performing arts in terms of haka waiata, um, in terms of the uh, motiatea or the ability to hold on to the traditional um, events that had, had happened or ancestral lines that, that we come from and be able to put that in a um, waiata form, in a singing form, through to weaponry mm. or tutawa mm. in terms of training our warriors for particular um, yeah. roles. Yeah. And they were critical roles, it was life and death yeah. roles during those times. With regards to the selection of certain people, it was ensuring that that knowledge was carried on, on. you know, mm. and, and not lost. And we can't be sure nowadays in our families mm. that that is going to be actually the, ca the case yeah. whereas uh, that was um, one way of, of absolutely um, mm. knowing that yeah. the history of the people mm. the belief in um, the cosmology and atua that was going to be yeah. that was going to be there forever and we you know we've got the privilege really of having yeah. having that knowledge passed on to us today yeah. And I believe because of that structure mm. of traditional learning. Special people were selected mm. uh, to go to the Wharewānanga. And I think likewise with the women, mm. you know, for the Karanga and for Waiata, mm. they, and they weren't like today told, oh, you should learn the Karanga. They were just picked out because they had a certain something about them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I suppose the way they listened or whatever, uh, but, you know, they were singled out to learn things, mm. learn about uh, the rituals and the traditions tikanga of our iwi. At traditional wānangas, the numbers were few, mm. and that was, that was one way of ensuring that um, all students had individual attention mm. um, and that the outcomes were going to be successful mm. and, and the goal of achievement was going to be attained. The students were always reminded to come in to that whare wānanga was, uh, uh, wasn't just an opportunity, it was one of the greatest things that could happen to that person because they're coming in there to relearn the history that those, those uh, teachers have got for the sake of the the, the, the ongoing life of the people. When students um, were selected mm. yeah, at the age of 12, and they, were, they, would be, they, they, they would be stayed there for about four, five years. That's the length of time. They would have to wash themselves, uh, have their hair cut, mm. and there were different practices in different uh, schools. 
but the school that my father-in-law went said that they had to um, wash themselves, cleanse themselves, so that there was no, none of the uh, sort of uh, human um, mm. badness on them, on the system. And water was always a purifying yeah. uh, element. And they would move in, uh, in formation, and stand in a row, uh, like this meeting house. Mm. They would come in through the doorway and they would stand. And there was always be a, a pole or a tuahu, a place where they will come and it would be a, probably a stone in the middle of the house. Mm. And there uh, they would, uh, uh, there a certain chant will be chanted, uh, inviting them to come in and inviting them to stand before that sacred pillar. Mm. And while they were at that sacred pillar, uh, each one was, in my father-in-law's case, they went to, to kiss it and then they, and to bite, to bite the stone. Mm. And then they would go and stand to the side. And that was one of the practices that was very important. And then you would sit, you would sit cross-legged in front of the, the tutor, mm. one teacher, the other two would be sitting off. So okay. those were some, and when you finish that, when you finish that, you could uh, stand up and you had to go out and you had to have another wash. Mm. They cleanse you again to take all the tapu mm. of you. But when they took the tapu of you, you didn't go back and go back to your home. Yeah. No, they had a special place outside the perimeter of the farinui, of the place where you were learning, where the students stayed and where the, the next one along was where the tohungas stayed. Oh. So they, they were selected places, eh? Mm. So there was always a, a, a formal way of doing things, coming in, mm. sitting down, receiving all the information when you had, when, the, the, when it, by daybreak, when the sun was just starting to come up, they would finish. Karakia was always Karakia thanking that unseen waiter mm. mm. for the power of memorizing, for the power of opening one eye, for the power of hearing, for the power of memorizing. All of those things, those were the most important kinds of prayers in uh, in those incantations, yes. is always. But you know, Eeyore's name was only mentioned uh, by the uh, by the uh, by the priest, mm. not by the students. Mm. It was too sacred. Yeah, yeah. And, and so the, so so those were some of the formal uh, activities that took place from the beginning to the end. Uh, sometime it was an old lady when the first students came into the house. There was always a lady there to welcome them. Could be the most beautiful yeah, old lady or the most ugliest old lady. <laughs> but look, it's a lady. And they would come. And her job would be to, to uh, cook rarauhe, the, the roots of the, the fern. And uh, the, because rarauhe, uh, they had no flour, and they would pound the roots and make it into a, like a flour and make it into like a bread. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's what you call that takako, they call it takako. Mm. And make a bit, they would bring it in here and then uh, she would she would break a piece off mm. and then she would pass it down between her legs. Oh. And between her legs and then she would feed it into that was one of those practices. Mm. And she would feed it in to to identify that being as being specially welcomed not only by the Tohunga but by the lady of the place. Oh, okay. Yeah, very important. Mm. And uh, if you didn't have that done well, you weren't even class, you were probably asked to leave. Today we have all different styles of teaching and different styles of learning, yeah. Is that the way they were taught back in the days of our Whare the, the Tohunga started to talk, he repeated again to make sure you remember it. He repeated it again to make you remember it twice, to repeat it again another three or four times. And then when he got tired, the other fellow would stand up and they regurgitate. And by the time you, you either you either forget it or you learn it. Or yeah. Uh, because goodness gracious me, just having seven repeats of that sort of uh, 
ka moya tā mi uru i a mea, kia puta mai ko tūtāne kai, ka moya tūtāne kai i a hina mō, kia puta mai ana ko. You know, you just hear that uh, after the third or fourth one, if you've got a good memory, sticks, but it's going to be like that. And then on top of that, when that's finished, they would go back over that again and then they start telling you about each of those people. Mm. They show you what they did. Yeah. One was a bit of a nosy guy, the other one was a bit of a fighter, the other one was a lover, mm. uh, and that, that kind of thing, you know, yeah. they tell you. So, rote learning was really, um, yeah, sort of like the way of learning back in the traditional times as well, and like you said earlier, that it was done in the dark. We had the, the old gentlemen from, gentlemen from uh, Tainui. Oh, okay. There was Henare Tu Whangai. And Henare Tu Whangai uh, went to a, a Maori school where he said he only had two teachers. And the first teacher would recount uh, a particular uh, whakapapa of the gods and they would go for a certain one and stop. And then they would repeat it again. Mm. And they would repeat it again. And then if he got a bit tired, the second teacher was over there, he would do the same. Yeah. And all the same, at the same time, the, the student is just listening. Yeah. Is listening. Mm. And by the time they would have regurgitated that information, say about uh, 10 times, uh, you know, over and over repeating it, the student was expected to catch yeah. all those words. Yeah. And then once, and then, then the, the student would take a stone and put it in the mouth, and and sometimes they would they would uh, just let it roll around in their mouth just to remind them that at that time they came down to a certain part of the whakapapa. or they would have a stick, and then the stick with a, with an obsidian stone, and they would mark the stick. One or they would one, two, three. They just scratch it on there because remember everything was dark. Now we get to the two stones the two pebbles that were sent down. It is related that at the Whare Wānanga in Ahure, in Kāwhia, that these pebbles, they were actually um, portrayed as big stones, and one was at one end of the Wānanga, Whare Wānanga, and one was at the other, and the students were able to sit on the big stones, but from time to time, uh, the smaller pebbles were put in the student's mouth and they were well I had no idea what 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 on earth they would put a pebble in your mouth for when you're learning so one day when I was learning uh, I decided I would get a pebble it wasn't any it wasn't a red pebble or a white pebble it was just another pebble I washed it to clean it and just big enough for me not to swallow uh, but small enough for me to be conscious that I had to concentrate on this pebble inside me, inside my mouth. And do you know what? I concentrated. And perhaps that was the reason. Perhaps this was a, a, an aid, a, a teaching aid that was used to ensure that the student would always be alert. Would you know of any circumstances or of anything that would happen if that knowledge was passed from one person to someone else that was not of that line? Well, let's go back to the student. Mm. The student could leave after the uh, after the, the course, could go out and meet with the girlfriend or with the boyfriend, with the girlfriend. They could not pass on any of that information that they received in here to the girlfriend. To do that would be a, a sure sign of death, or something would happen to you. And therefore, it was there was a strict order of learning here, and you only you only uh, uh, shared that information when you were invited to do so but you couldn't share it with your closest friend, your mother, your father, you couldn't. Uh, only on the, at a special occasions when you were uh, asked to do that by the Thomas. It is clear that there were tapu, uh, and there were instances of the very highest knowledge. Now, I wouldn't say that what we teach in our uh, universities today is the highest knowledge. 
there were varying degrees of what well, we might call it uh, esoteric and exoteric knowledges. Yeah? In terms of the most precious of knowledge that you, you only gave to those who you, you judge as being ready for it and you judge as being able to handle those, those knowledges. Just mention this old lady, Auntie Naki. Um, a, a lot of us call her Nani Naki, Naki Kino. At, uh, in the middle of the King Country is a place called Midinga Te Kakara. Mm. And it's a very special place. Mm. Auntie Naki, she was acknowledged amongst uh, Ngati Maniapuru mm. as the, the very last graduate of the ancient Wharewananga at Midinga Te Kakara. Mm. I used to go and see the the old lady and, and have um, have some call it all with her, yeah. ask her questions, uh, and then I wonder, I asked her, Auntie, all of this knowledge, kakorero mau, mahari mau ke mau, ngene matai nanga katoa, kuariro yakwe, kape fiati amu ngara keite heke mai, kamate kwe, kamate ene matai, and she says kamate ai, kamate ene matai, ngene toi mahara. Uh, when I die, I'll take them with me because they're too heavy for you. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you can't carry them. Mm. And I said, well, thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. And she laughs at me. She says, there are some things that should die, mm. uh, that, that shouldn't be carried on mm. because they are, they, are, they are too hurtful. Mm. Now, your question in terms of the relationship to how we operated as far as one in the pre-European, mm -hmm. to how we operate today in the year 2000 um, mm -hmm. millennium, this millennium, there's a huge difference. I think there's a number of differences in the sense that one, we are not the um, dominant populace yeah. in this country today. Two, we've had to adapt and modify the way we live, mm -hmm. and as part of that to ensure one, our survival, mm -hmm. two, our sustainability as a people, to ensure that uh, Māori um, remain a permanent part of the landscape. Mm. Uh, probably third, uh, ensure solidarity as a people. And then probably fourth, our success in, in, in taking responsibility to determine what success means to us. So those are particular ways that um, I think uh, we've had to adapt yeah. to ensure that we, 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 we uh, continue to survive and thrive in today's world. I think it's, there, there are major differences between what we call Farewana today yeah. and what our, uh, our Tupuna probably would have treated as Farewana. Yeah. But there are, there are similar similarities too because it's all about education, mm. it's all about learning and how that learning should be applied. Yeah. Some of the knowledge from the ancient times is it, um, do you think that it has been passed down in the correct ways or do you think that we should go back to how it was done back in the I don't think we could ever go back to that time. Mm. It was too strict. Yeah. You know, you just look at you and I. Mm. Uh, we couldn't come in here no. naked. <laughs> yeah. uh, you feel cold. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with them, you know, with the, because the, uh, the, uh, just after, after winter, that's when the people normally came into school, oh, okay. just from uh, uh, five months from winter, summer, autumn, winter, and then spring, spring mm -hmm. and then into summer, and then, and then they would close down. Oh. And uh, at the time when you're planting your kai and all that, when they close down, because planting mm -hmm. takes prior to press. But uh, during the winter and the spring period, that's when they start to, uh, to do the training and the teaching. And I don't think we could um, uh, replicate, replicate what, yeah. what they did. Mm. It's too difficult. Mm. Do you think it has affected us as a Māori people with the loss of our ancient Farewana? There would be some who would assert that we never lost it. Mm. Yeah. That it, is, it remains hidden. Hekuda mm. ihunaya. Who's to say what we've lost yeah. and who's to say what, 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 we're, what we're regaining and reviving? Yeah.
uh, it's, it's all part of the human condition. My main concern is how to translate or how to take that wonderful system, methodologies that those Komatua had. And do you think our people can re rely on just a piece of timber and mark it, or a stone in their mouth and chew it, and uh, or come uh, in the evenings and learn from six o'clock to two o'clock in the morning? You think our people can do that? They've been sport. And if we want to get back to that era, then that's what we have to do. We have to clear the deck and start again. But a lot of our, but we have to start with the younger people. No good starting at age 15. You get nowhere. What is an oral history to you? Hinemoa married to Tanekai. They had a son called Fatumaidangi. Fatumaidangi uh, had a wife and had a son called Taiwede. Taiwede married Tam Yuru. And they had a son called Tukaki. That's oral history. I talk to you, I tell you. Yeah. There's my mountain, uh, Ngongotaha. And Ngongotaha is the, the Ngongo is the, the sucking mm. uh, of the water from the, from that, uh, the heart, from, yeah, the from the good, mm. from the calabash. Mm. Yeah, Ngongotaha. And uh, uh, there, and I could tell you the story of Ngongotaha. Mm. That's oral history. Yeah. Oral tradition, it's just kōrero. Um, it may be whakapapa, it mm. may be waiata, mm. um, it may be karakia, mm. um, so, so anything really that yeah. comes out of the mouth um, was acceptable. And, and one of, one of the, one of the um, sayings that I, I um, hear was that, you know, we heard it so often that it, it got etched. It was mm. like it was written on my forehead, mm. and and you know, you you, you walked around around mm -hmm. carrying that knowledge with you. As related earlier, oral is is exactly what I'm doing now. I'm talking. So oral tradition is a manner in which those things which were considered important to survival of mankind was handed down verbally. It was about knowing who you were and that was to know who you were and, and where you came from, that's genealogy and known to the Māori as whakapapa. And so they recited and learnt their oral whakapapa and so they were able to say things like this. Ko tainui te waka, tainui is the waka, ko hoturoa te tangata, hoturoa was the captain and the rangatira of that waka. Nā hoturoa ko hotu, nā hotu ope ko hotu āwhio, nā hotu āwhio ko hotu matapū, nā hotu matapū ko mōtai, nā mōtai ko ue, nā ue ko raka, nā raka ko kākati, nā kākati ko tāwhao, nā tāwhao ko tūrongo, nā tūrongo ko raukawa, nā raukawa ko maniapoto, nā maniapoto ko te kawairi rangi, nā te kawairi rangi ko rungate rangi, nā rungate rangi ko uruhina, nā uruhina ko te kawa tuarua, nā te kawa tuarua ko te kanawa. Nā te kanawa ko paratekawa, nā paratekawa ko hore, nā hore ko pehi tū korehu, nā pehi tū korehu ko tū pōtahi, nā tū pōtahi ko te winitana tū pōtahi, nā te winitana tū pōtahi ko tākaka maniapoto, nā tākaka maniapoto ko pehi maniapoto, nā pehi maniapoto ko Thomas pehi maniapoto, nā Thomas pehi maniapoto ko a. And so you have some 26, 27 generations on one line only. Now, if you were to take those 27 generations and break them up into the brothers and the sisters and how they went back and married each other, then you will understand about how difficult it is to rote learn, to rote learn, and that's what oral tradition was about. So it was important. If I quoted Papa and I missed out somebody in this lineage, then I would leave out a whole generation and it would be incorrect. And so that was the importance of oral tradition. Of course we know that uh, in the mid or early 1800s, the missionaries, um, the English arrived, the Pākehā arrived, 
and they bought the pen and the paper. And we were able to write that name down, and we were absolutely certain then that we wouldn't make a mistake. But of course we have. And so oral tradition are those that happened before the arrival of the pen and the paper. When we sit in this whare here, this meeting house here at Otafo, it's pretty clear uh, to see that um, the maintenance of our traditional knowledge wasn't through the writing as we do today or through um, our emails or our texting or our uh, computer use but more so through traditional forms and the traditional forms as we sit here is one, mm. our discussion mm. <clears throat> in terms of our core or two, in terms of our art forms. Yeah, this meeting house, there you'll see carvings as we have here, um, which depict ancestor, ancestors or events that were carried out over a, a long period of time, which has current relevance. Mm to our lives today. You have uh, tuku tuku panels, or the panels on the side of the meeting house, which again depict particular designs, which represent particular mm. um, events, themes, not only in terms of um, historical knowledge, but also in terms of uh, concepts, philosophies and principles to guide us in how we live our lives today. Yeah. So the Potama panel, which is the sort of staircase to heaven panel, which is over there, yeah. um, just outlines the, rel the, the, the connections that we have to our past, the connections we have of the spiritual realms mm. and the physical realms here yeah. on earth. The Tukutuku panels are um, extremely, mm. not only in terms of their aesthetic look, uh, in terms of the, the colour, the, the colour, the architectural designs, but the the, the other layers, which is the spiritual yeah. um, aspects of it and the conceptual, which mm. um, promote particular philosophies and principles yeah. that guide us in terms of how we carry ourselves, yeah. but also provide solutions mm. to some of the challenges and issues that we face yeah. in our contemporary lives. Yeah. Then I look to the roof of this whare and I see the cool fi fi patterns for this whare here. Mm. And again, not only aesthetically beautiful, but in terms of the depth and breadth of knowledge that they portray through their designs and elements, mm. um, again, conceptualise um, particular philosophies and principles and his histories of our people that have absolute relevance to us today. Mm. Yeah, so those are, those, those are just some, as, as way of beginning, identifying <coughs> some of the particular traditional elements of our knowledge base, but also it's absolute relevance to today's contemporary, contemporary world. Although um, waiata and carving, the weaving of cloaks, tukutuku panels, ko fai fai, were actually um, perpetuated and practiced and created, for want of a better word, in the terrestrial world, they were a method by which, shall I say, Māori mankind utilize the, the sacred knowledge from above so that it could always be around them. Let us take the waiata. A waiata, if you listen to a waiata, I'm talking ancient waiata, moteatea. If you listen to a moteatea, it has a, a, it's sung in monotone and it sounds like the wind blowing. It's, it's like nature around us. And, and it rises a little and then it goes down so that it becomes like a wailing. And it's the voice of the queer. Te roa o te po e oho ai au He rau te hurihanga So you can hear just like a wail of a wind. But in, in that waiata expressed firstly the cry of the, of the composer, 
the anger in some cases where it became a haka, the question of the, of the composer it came out in the waiata, so that waiata became their um, repository of perpetuating an event, a thought, a loss, uh, those things which were they, they figured were very important to them. And so that's, and, and I think all songs used to be like that. They each had a message. To me, the, the waiata uh, and the the waiata and the whakatauki, as we know now, they they capture so much. Um, I've collected about 40 waiata from Tauranga, and if I've annotated them, in other words, I've sort of taken them apart and had a look at them and sat with the old kaumātua to, to see whether, whether what I'm doing is right, even though, though I'm sort of in that category. <laughs> uh, but um, what is interesting is you'll notice a pattern coming through in the stories. Really, they're stories of our lives. Mm. They're stories of uh, events, milestones. Yeah. They are mar in, in fact, to me, waiata are really calendars of events. Mm. That's what I call them, yeah. ngā maramataka. They're calendars of, of events mm. of the past. And they also um, state a particular time when agitation of iwi, mm. when iwi mm. agitated, yeah. or you know, politically, but because you see all sorts of waiata about um, resistance at a particular yeah. stage in our lives. In our waiata projects our, as well as our, our people histories, the environment around mm. us, the tensions, the relationships that, that create people. But further to that, uh, we also take the, the symbols that, that each iwi or each uh, area mm. projects and we take those to use as indicators of how we hold on to what is dear to us. Yes. For example, let me give you an example. In a lot of our waiata, well, in a few, not a lot, mm. we have the, the toroa, right? Mm. The seabird, so that comes up a lot. Mm. We have the, the kohatu, the rocks, right? Which comes up a lot in our waiata. Whereas, so that tells us, that tells you about coastal people. Further inland, I would say there may not be, I don't know, but there may not be as much uh, in the form of uh, that kind of environment, mm. rocks and things, because there, there probably aren't very many rocks in the river, but there, there may be on land. So, you know, to me, dependent on the environment, physical environment, um, the, the symbolic environment and the mental environment in the mind is developed yeah. or can be looked at. Yeah. So these are part of our... To um, me that's all part of the learning that our, that oh, our yeah. tūpuna handed down yeah. and that's why, you know, the waiata is so amazing. Yeah. Whakatauki. A proverbial saying, I suppose, uh, for want of a better word. One of the most uh, interesting whakatauki that I recall is that which was left by our tupuna Manyapoto on his deathbed. He looked at his children and he said, he uttered these words, A muri, a muri kia mau ki te kawau māro whanakeake, whanakeake. I remember this being spoken by my grandparents and never understood what it meant. But later on when I decided to study the history of our people of Ngāti Maniapoto, I found that between 1800 and 1802 thereabouts, the greatest battle in all of Maoridom took place. And that was at Ngāroto, which is approximately two to three kilometers away from Tawamutu. That battle was about 10,000 warriors from the rest of the southern part of the North Island of New Zealand, being conscripted by one of our tūpuna, 
and bringing them up to supposedly and hopefully annihilate Waikato and Maniapoto. When Maniapoto and Waikato did their head count, it was obvious that uh, they had nowhere near that number, possibly in the vicinity of two to three thousand. And so when you look at one-on-one -on -one armed combat, uh, this would have been almost a death warrant for them. And so they sat and they discussed what it is they would do. And one of the things that Māori Dim does is you look to the past to retain your present and give you the pathway to the future. And so they looked at the past. What was it in the past that could help them at that present time? And they remembered. They remembered the whakatauki left by their tipuna manyapoto who said, Amuri kia mau ki te maru. Hold fast to the swoop of the comorant. What on earth does that mean? A comorant is a bird. When it flies and it looks down into the water or wherever and it sees its prey or its food, it dives and to ensure that it moves at the speed of a bullet, it brings its wings in, it tucks its wings in, and it does fall at a very much faster pace. Immediately it touches its food or source or the prey that it set out to get. It encircles it with its wings. Now, how do you apply that to saving Waikato and Maniapoto? They then took the battle out to the lake Ngaroto. And at Lake Ngaroto there were two lakes. Basically what they did, they enticed, they enticed the comorant to come into to come in and, and swoop down and annihilate them. So in came the warriors, in came the enemy between the two lakes, and when they were all between the two lakes, Ngāti Manyapoto and Waikato came and encircled them from behind. And because if you go there, it's swampy. And of course they had no way of getting out. And so they annihilated the 10,000. We survived. And that's why I'm able to sit here and talk to you today. But that is the importance of Whakatauki. It's about reminding us of certain values, of certain qualities, decisions that we may be able to make. And so Fakatoki are very important because they do, they speak words of wisdom. Fakatoki, of course, you know, they're, they're a slightly different uh, genre. Mm. You know, they, you know they, they, still, they are still like the waiata uh, because they hold certain things. But, you know, to me, they take a different form because they hold, in my view, well, you know, they're about um, capturing uh, iwi status, mm. iwi mana, it's sort of, you know, my property, not my, our property, mm. I should say, our iwi property. And so you have, you know, the different whakatauki um, indicating that that belongs to certain people, certain tribes, certain iwi. But further to that, it also, to me, Fakatoki tells about the niceties of life, yeah. but also, you know, the pitfalls of life. Mm. And, you know, in different Fakatoki, you can bring up all those things. Uh, and it tells, Fakatoki tells us about uniting as one sometimes, mm. or about um, honouring someone else, yeah. mm. belittling someone, yep. you know, we've got all those types of things. So, Fakatoki have all those kinds of um, knowledge bases from which to draw upon. Let us first discuss the question in reference to Fai Korero. Again, I always look at there is no word in Māori that is wasted. And so if you have Fai Korero, Fai is to follow, Korero is to speak. So in the process of practices, customary practices of rituals of encounter that is coming onto a marae or in a place where speeches uh, take place and the process of Māori etiquette. Whaikorero means that um, you have 
speakers, male speakers who stand uh, and their process of speaking is, is pretty well set down. So if it's a toparapara that starts the speech and then the mihi to those who have departed, the mihi to the king to Haitia, to the kopapa of the day, and reference to connections in terms of genealogy between the speaker and perhaps the visitors or the visitors uh, to the to the tangata whenua. And that's that's quite straightforward. However, what I find is that we've forgotten how to fai kōrero. What one should do is, before you go to a marae, is to do your homework and do it well. So that by the time you get there, not only do you know who they are, who their ancestors are, what their whakapapa is, the name of their meeting house, the name of their wharekai, um, any links and connections between you and them, when you know that, when you stand to do whai kōrero, it is so easy to make your kōrero of the greatest interest, both to, if you're the visitor, to your hosts and connecting to you. So fai kōrero means to follow. What we do today is we just repeat over and over again the very same things. Perhaps what we have to do is to, is to go back and learn Possibly not orally, but you know, there are many libraries and books that are available to us to know um, our geographic and hapu areas, those outside our geographic and hapu areas. And so Fai Kōrero becomes the most dynamic. And, and, and you speak about where does Fai Kōrero sit with oral traditions and history. The tradition is that you, each speaker should have some topic that is different to the previous one, will differ from the speaker after him, but will add impetus and knowledge and understanding for those who are there listening to it. That's fai kōrero, and in terms of oral, oral tradition, then as I've just said, it is there. That's where it can be related. And so even young people on the marae, uh, in the marae, listening to speakers, can gain their historical knowledge. It might be a small thing. It might be the name above the door. For instance, if somebody came from the East Coast and, and, and called it this marae, and stood outside and looked up and saw the name Ōtāpō, and would come in or sit on the pai pai, and it was his turn to stand up. He'd done his homework and he'd done it well. He'd looked at all the history books, and he would say, in Māori, he would say, I stand here to greet you. I greet the tupuna whare o tāwhao, and I recall that Tafal married Marutehiakina and had Tūrongo, and Tūrongo came to the east coast where I come from, and he married our princess Mahi Narangi. And from that is Tainui Waka, you the people of this area. And so that's how oral tradition connects us, connects us. Because I honestly believe there is only one thing in the world that can unite people, and that is Whakapapa. I can choose my friends I can't choose my relations. Whakapapa is bondage. It's the commitment and not the responsibility. And so, if we, the Māori people, throw Whakapapa away, we are throwing away our evolution theory. Well, there's multi layers of learning associated mm. through the uh, through kapahaka. Mm. There's the uh, retention mm. of um, of knowledge mm. through the um, the words mm. of the waiata. It's also bringing the entertainment 
aspect to uh, the learning and the maintenance and the understanding of those words through um, lyrics, and, uh, through songs, mm -hmm. through, through um, beats um, that resonate positively with the spirits and the souls of the people. Mm. Um, so it becomes not only an educational function but an entertaining function. Mm. I think the other aspects of it is around um, excellence. I think there's a pursuit of excellence in, in, the, in carrying out kapahaka, which is an intangible asset which becomes tangible when you apply it to the rest of your life. I think um, when you first start in kapahaka you become the learner, mm. but over time you become a teacher too, because you, mm. yeah, because you feel so fired up mm. around learning those waiata, you want other people to learn it too, yeah. and um, it's, it's part of what you can share and you want to embrace them and support them in their learning through teaching them those waiata. Yeah. But I think um, in essence the uh, most important part for me in terms of kapahaka is the community spirit, it's the solidarity, it's the kōtahi tanga mm. focus. It takes us away from you know, the mundane aspects of uh, working and living and, and those sorts of things mm. to actually doing a, a, an activity that fires us all up for a common mission mm. and a common cause, cause and it mobilises and motivates us to on a common theme and a common, on a common goal. So kapahaka is a um, is one is a, an example of how we can carry out a learning uh, experience through mobilising and motivating mm. our people through the culture, and not at the expense of the culture. Myths and legends, Paki Waitara Purako, as they're called in Maori, are the most important stories in Maori. Why are they important? Fairy tales. Because they, they tell us those things that we do not understand. Where does, where does the sun come from? Where does it go to? And so the, the, the myth and legend of Maui snaring the sun came to be. Every facet of myths, Purako, was to justify in their limited world at that stage of why things happen, when, how, who, what. Those are the things. That's why they're so important to them. Today, of course, science has moved in and uh, maybe sometimes we don't have to. We know where the sun comes from. And, but if you look at the wider parameters of their stories in myths and legends, they knew about the galaxies. They knew about honey and puna going the very extent of the universe to look for a place where the male essence and the female essence could procreate and thereby create man. And so I believe that myths and legends are very important. If we go to Whakairo, and those are those carvings, and if you look, you can see them behind me. They're very awe-inspiring. They're an art um, uh, you know, unto themselves. And I looked at um, the word whakairo, which is, which is the name given to these popo. They are carved. If you critique and analyse the word whakairo, it means to create once again through the process of the maggot. Now, Iro is a maggot, and the maggot's role in, in his or her life is to partake of human flesh during the decomposing process. Now, what happens when a carver takes a chisel and a mallet? and has a, a wood from the forest of Tane. The minute his chisel starts touching the wood, the chisel is likened to the maggot that once ate the flesh of that ancestor that the, the carver is once again creating. And so that's a thought that perhaps many people don't know. And so to me, that's what whakairo is. To bring back in symbolic form 
the ancestor through the process of the maggot decomposing his or her body. So that's what the, the pakairo is all about. Here we have a house. Mm. Here is the body of a house. And the house is called Taiwan. Mm. We've already had the whakapapa. Mm. But if we look at the, the main pillars around the edge, each pillar identifies a particular ancestor. That particular ancestor tells us all about that people mm. and their relationship to the next pillar. And there's a relationship be between each of these pillars mm. and in the end we get uh, not only uh, a local uh, information but we get a, a tribal and, and, and co-tribal information not only about Tarawa but also about Tarawa's relationship to Taranaki, relationship to Hastings, Heratoma, mm. relationship to Ngāpui. Why? Because the Kāwas were all from the different uh, tribes. So, the, the, you know, uh, oral history is very important in terms of helping a person of Māori origin to, to, to really feel good about themselves, mm. to really feel the team, you know, I thought I was a no good, I thought I was nobody. Yeah. All of a sudden, I've got all of this history, and that's my whari on which I stand. And I can turn there, and I've got relations there, I can turn over there, I've got relations over there. And so, the oral history to be, it's got to be told properly, exactly like the way in the old, in the old uh, whare wānanga. Everything had to be recited exactly as it was given to you. You couldn't go over there and say, well, this fellow here that came, uh, I, uh, you know, Tom Hanks, you know, give you another name. No, no, because I want you to be a part of my family. Uh, and some people will change names so that they could uh, succeed to, uh, yeah. you know, you can't go changing anything. And the same with today. You got these fucker puppers over here, around here, is Rongo Wetere, for instance, he created this. And I said to him, all the people who are going to be coming here to this place for, for, for performing art are not coming here uh, just for performing art. They want to find themselves. Mm. A lot of them were lost, yeah. absolutely lost. And the oral history, as told just in this house, was enough to settle those young people. And they said, I was told, I was useless, I was no good, I was a koretake, all of those words, those, and all of a sudden I come here, oh, I feel good. What did happen, what did they do after that? They started to settle down and got down to better themselves. Yeah. I think in essence, the under, for me, the headline point, pre-European, uh, 100 years ago and today, Mm. is the essence of learning by doing. Yeah. And learning by doing is, for me, the, the mm. way. Mm. Um, and I think what uh, Tawana Aotearoa has provided through its um, educational philosophy yeah. is really an applied approach mm. to learning. Uh, uh, learning by doing. And the diverse ranges that we currently have available mm. personify um, the learning by doing attitude. Hence the reason why, with the advent of programs like Mahi Ora, mm. we have the we, we cater for the audio, mm. the visual learner, the kinesthetic learner, mm. um, the written learner, the reading learner. So all the different learning styles really was a was was a recognition of identifying the diverse realities of learners, mm. and to be able to provide diverse solutions to those diverse realities yeah. of learners. One auntie told me that um, she would go to the bush with Granny um, so and so to to collect um, rongoa, mm. to collect leaves for um, that she would bring home, and and it was to be used for for um, certain sicknesses. Mm. And um, she said, "Well, we hardly talked because we had to climb up oh. the hill, <laughs> and they were right on the bush line of the mountain mm. um, when they um, took these particular." journeys mm. and she said 
So I learnt about it by the, the hard way, by having to go and go there and do it, and getting lost in the bush, and, and then getting found again, and, and all those sorts of things. Mm. So we, you know, we say Fakaro mo Titiro, and then there's the Korero, but maybe it's the Mahi mm. as well that it's that the learning is in the doing, and, and, and doing we, we all know that. And yeah. then, and then the other thing that. Um, in, in, in oral histories that, that struck me um, was that the imagery mm. that they that they um, presented me with, um, as this auntie said, I not only can, as I'm talking to you, she said, I not only can, can see us walking along the bush line, she said, I can feel the tiredness mm. in my legs mm. right now as I'm sitting here. And she said, and I can smell the plant of the the leaves of the plant mm. as we crush them as my my nanny said to me smell this mm. know that smell she said I can still smell that smell yeah. right here as I'm sitting here talking to you uh, my own mother and her family who uh, and there were many uh, women in the family mm. uh, were all taught uh, different things. Uh, my mother, for example, was taught how to plant food, mm -hmm. and so I call that a, a form of whare wānanga. Mm -hmm. And it's um, the learning in the, um, the more, I suppose we could say, um, general learning of, of the word wānanga. Mm -hmm. um, they learned my doing, uh, they learned my uh, watching, and of course we were introduced to that as well, by learning, by listening, by watching and by doing. As opposed to the theory uh, that we possibly have in today's wānanga and whare wānanga. I wasn't there, but, but, but if Auntie Naki is an example of those kinds of things, a very um, switched on person who used all of her senses. Mm. Let me just develop that a little bit with you. I I never run this past Auntie Nikki, but but she would she would also talk about she would always be talking about kite and ro. So I I, I have this um, this thesis I suppose mm. that I've I've only explored with a few people in a few few instances that in terms of the physical senses in Maori there's only two. There's not five <laughs> because Kite, see. Okay. Rongo is to smell. Yeah. Rongo is to hear. Mm -hmm. Rongo is to taste. Yeah. Rongo is to feel. Mm -hmm. So, so there's there's these two primary senses. Mm -hmm. And if a, a person has control of those those two senses, then the world is wide open to him or her. Mm -hmm. So, in all of her teachings, Auntie Naki, and all of her learnings because it was both ako, eh? mm -hmm. that concept of ako, learning and teaching. In all of her learnings and teachings, she would make sure that those, those senses were touched on. Her, her best expression of things was in Māori. Mm -hmm. And most of the time she talked about rōmo, and ki te ko ki te ko. So there's, there's that kind of beginning that in learning and teaching, the senses are fully involved. Yeah. The way you were taught when you were a child back then by your komatsu and all that, um, can that be ever replaced or replicated or in your experiences at happening? Definitely so not. Yeah. Definitely mm. not. I just find that everything I learned from them, mm. you know, just learning to look at um, the way the trees blow, right? Mm. And the way the wind, I'm, my mother, my own mother used to say, when the mount used to have fog on it, she used to say, Ara te potai o moa. The mount, as it's better known, well, as mm. it's normally known, uh, has got its hat on. Now, that was her way of saying that it was going to rain. Mm. Now, that kind of educational matauranga, you know, has never ever been sort of, I've never heard that kind of that way of putting knowledge. And mum used to always, uh, also used to say, uh, when a train used to cross the, the, the big bridge from one of our local communities, Matapihi across the Tauranga, oh, okay. and the train roared, she said it was going to rain. Mm. 
-hmm. In fact, a lot of them said it was going to rain. And you know, absolutely right, not yeah. long after it would rain. Now, to me, that knowledge came from knowing the environment they were a part of mm -hmm. and knowing, well, I'm not quite sure what, yeah. but knowing something about the environment they were a part of. Yeah. Uh, the other thing also that I noticed, you know, that I think can't be replicated, within our particular area, the, the tide goes in and it goes out because it's in the harbour um, where I was raised. And when the tide would be nearly in, they would say, um, now's the time to do certain things. Mm. And when the spring tides came, what they call the king, what, what I've heard other call the king tides, but we knew as the spring tides, mm. very high, yeah. uh, they would say, right, this is the time when the, the um, tides ebb mm. that you may be able to go and do this and do that. Um, and, and so their knowledge of the sea especially, mm. for us the sea especially was where we learnt a lot because well, we, we were around it all the time. Well it was around us I should say, we were a part of it, it wasn't a part of us, we were a part of it. And so all that learning from the sea and from the winds blowing off Moal mm. told us different things about what was going to happen, whether it was going to rain and so forth yeah. and so on. And so I don't think it can be ever, rep uh, be really? ever replicated. Um, the things that they did, they, they knew which plants to take, like, you know, what people are discovering mm. now. For example, uh, in our particular hapu, it was a known fact that runa or dock, uh, yeah. the dock leaves, yes. uh, were great for haki haki mm. or for sores mm. in the past. They were a form of poultice. Uh, kumara, when um, you took it and you scraped it, mm. another form of poultice. Mm. So the things that are being taught today at Parewananga, uh, no, uh, at, uh, in the past I should say, can never be replicated yeah. because of those things. Because um, you just have to look today and um, just like you said how um, they just need to look <coughs> at the moment and when it's wearing its port day it's going to rain. Yes. Yeah. And today we've got all this technology and satellite readings and they yeah. still get the weather wrong. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and, and you'll notice with the, the satellites today, what, what you're noticing is that they're looking down, you know, from above and mm. they're seeing the cloud formations and they can, yeah. you know, they track the wind, of the uh, the weather. But, you know, uh, that, that was one thing my mother said, you know, she always said, oh, arate potai o moa. Mm. There's a Moal's hat. You know, as a younger person, you sort of think, oh, you know, God, she's gone a bit, you know, a bit queer. But <laughs> when you learn later on, you know, it had uh, it had a method to its madness. Yeah. So from parenting to turuna to medicines, it's whole multi-learning, all combined into one. Mm. But the other thing too that's interesting is. It's like a cycle. It's cyclic in in uh, connection, right? One leads on to the other. So in a formal situation, you have someone learning wayata. Then in in that wayata, you have young people being taught. And then in in that situation, from that wayata or from that formal learning, you have histories being known, or you have the way the sea or the the river flows and why it flows from south to north as opposed from north to south. And then in, in those situations, formal and informal learning through Wānanga and through discussions, which I, I call Wānanga as well, because that's what they are, whether formally or informally, are all part of learning. Yeah. So most of those, uh, like my father-in-law, were great teachers in their own right. Because I used to watch my grandfather, my father-in-law, Te Kani Te Ua, talking to way he did a culture group. That was his couple group. And what did they do? They won, what, nine times yeah. at the festival? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and they used to wonder why those people uh, won. Mm -hmm. And he said, learn the words first learn it exactly, get the pronunciation right, then I'll sit down and
and I will explain to you what the words are saying. And some of the words are archaic, but only it takes an archaic man like that from Jurassic Park to be able to <laughs> translate those kinds of things. But he did that. And by the time he finished, he said, right, I want you now to go away and come up with actions that actually explain those words. You don't have to know the words. You, you just sign read. Mm. And that's exactly what happened. And every time Waihidi stood up, every time their mouths, you could hear the, the beauty of the, the, mm. the, the voice. And they were always saying, you know, somebody, you got a beautiful voice. Oh, God gave us this. You got, you got a good voice. Mm. Why don't you use it yourself? And you got to look after your voice. Uh, look at your eyes, they're alive. Mm. Yes, because I know what I'm singing about. Mm. And I'm happy. Yeah. And then when it comes to a time when you say it, the, the, the eyes change. Mm. Everything changed. And so it was that kind of thing that happened. And in the end, the people who were watching from outside, even at a distance, not only heard the words, they felt the way to it that came from it. Because the Kani, the Ua, always said, Akoto kupu, na teatu. Na ida, mehemei homei nia te akoto, tena whakahoki nia te atahua o ngā kupu. You know, God gave you those, those voices and in thankfulness to him, to that God, let us sing in with beauty to him and send back those words in beauty and for him and all others to hear. It was tremendous and I've retained all of that information because it's helped me in my work in sharing. Uh, I think methodologies of the old school, mm, mm. I brought it forward. Yeah. Well, for instance, in learning a song, this is how I would teach it. And you would uh, break it up with it. And then I'm going to take this song, which was uh, uh, Pairoa Rongonui from uh, Taranaki. And uh, I learned it in a short time and it was to this tune, where the stick, which was a popo or a walking stick, would be tapped, and then the song. <laughs> E piki kiru nga ki tō waka ki a te māna wānui. Hapai ngā ngā hoe ko te pono ko te tika ko te rangi māri a te tāta ko te aroha te punga ko te toko i werohia e mohi te pau he re tangata e. And it was when I was a young girl and slept in the pa, or the wharepuni, as they were called in those days, alongside my, my grandparents and, uh, and other kui and kurua. And, and one person would be speaking. And I, I sort of remembered that he was telling a story. And you looked across and you saw people across the other side uh, on mattresses with eyes closed but I knew they were listening intently. And at times, I think I closed my eyes, I probably dozed off, but when I woke, not necessarily at that time, but many years later, I remembered what was said. So what happens, I suppose, is that what you hear when you've got your eyes closed in absolute concentration, there's no distractions, you, your ears, take in the message, whatever it is. It's um, sent up to the brain, and the brain puts it in a folder somewhere back there. And sometimes you're able to recall it when required, but in this case, I recalled it when I was 50 years older. And I suppose that's why I learned, because nobody taught me how to do whakapapa, nobody. 
Nga tūrongo i waere takuara ki te tae rāwhiti ki a tāki timu, ko te waka tēnā o tamatea kahungu nu kahukura nu i rākei i kuru a tūpuru puru rangi tū e hutuaka. Nobody taught me that. But somewhere I must have heard it. And so perhaps when I looked at a piece of paper many years later, it just came out of that folder and was put up the front here like you do on your 2007 version of Microsoft Works. I'm only just saying this. So maybe if we, if we were classified as ignorant native savages in the past, perhaps they didn't really understand us. My grandmother stayed with us and um, she taught, taught us about planting, mm. the different things to plant and when, when to plant it. And um, we lived in an age where we had the rua, mm. the rua oh, okay. pit. And of course it was a good place for me to hide, <laughs> right? But at the same time, now the kumara and uh, riwai that we grew, we had big plantations. Um, they were put into the kumara pit, uh, or to the rua we called it, and but they they were layered with araraufe or fern. Now we never understood why that was, and I asked my auntie in later years when I was looking for information, and she said that was done so that they wouldn't rot, right? So that the the moisture, whatever, if there was any moisture, uh, the uh, the fern, the dried fern, would uh, give it the uh -huh. aerated uh, conditioning that it needed. Mm. And so, you know, I found that interesting. When we went out to harvest our food, our kai, and it was collected, mm. our whanau used to say, um, especially our aunties, the potatoes that are cut, they will be eaten straight away. Why was that? Because if you left them in the rua mm. uh, with the others, it would rot the others. It's the same, oh. it's really the same type of, of uh, comments that are made. You mm. put one bad apple, you yeah, know. So, you know, they had that knowledge way back in those days, yeah. and this is about what? Um, mm. Oh, years ago, yeah. back in the 1940s, 50s. Yeah. Yeah, they did the same for Carboy. Yes, mm. but you know, they learned that from, of course, their, their own parents and grandparents. Yeah. So that was learning way back then. Mm. And, uh, you know, I've always known that, you know, you don't put the, the yeah. rotten, something that is rotten or decaying, yeah. you know, with yeah. other with things. Other things yeah. um, so that was learning. Mm. Very recently, I, um, from the, the area where, where I come from, mm. um, I, I'd like to name it, yeah. Pirongia. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in, in that area towards Kafia, mm. um, I, I, I thought, we thought at home that our elders were um, becoming fewer and fewer in number, and we are, as many places are in the country, from, a, from an area rich in history, mm. and we should try and perhaps capture some of that history before that history was lost. Mm. Um, so I, I um, have begun a, a series of interviews, and it wasn't so much um, the knowledge of our history that I was um, looking at, um, but more how that knowledge was passed on to them. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I was very interested in, uh, in that transmission mm -hmm. of knowledge and um, the validity of that transmission, if, if you understand what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I believe, again, I'll return to that concept of whakarungo mm -hmm. and te tiro, um, because when I asked ask um, my elders, you know, how, how did you know that? Um, uh, because I was told that. Mm. And, um, and not only was I told that, but um, so and so else was told that. And then mm. we walked about, we talked about it. Mm. And so you get that sort of validity of information, um, not just purely, but one way was through um, sharing that information mm. and interacting on that mm. information. Um, and then 
um, the information that was obtained or talked about had also been passed on in that same way because the obvious question was, well, how did you know? Yeah. How do you know about that? Who told you? Yeah. And so, oh, my mother told me or my grandmother told me. Yeah. And so you get that concept of oral tradition yeah. um, through, through passing, passing down, handing on um, the knowledge. The people of today, especially young people of today, their attention span and that is not very thing when it comes to learning. Well, you'll find, you'll find, uh, you'll find it. Yeah, that's what I was told by mm. a number of people. You, you mean two weeks? Are you saying in two weeks you can train the people? I said, well, uh, I said, if I can teach them 32 songs or 42 songs yeah. in two weeks, uh, longest. I can have them at six o'clock, and uh, they know what to do. The first, the first three or four days was difficult mm. because they were so used to either watching rugby, mm. or going to the casino, or going to the pub, or going. But after the third day, I said to them, "If you don't come uh, and get here at six o'clock, you're not going." And that was one of the incentives. They wanted to go across to New York. They wanted to go across to to uh, Los Angeles. But I said, if you don't come, so uh, by the by the fourth practice, oh, they were all there six o'clock, and they didn't even say hello or anything. They just went straight to bed mm. because they knew they had three or four hours before. And then the span of attention wasn't a problem. Mm. In fact, the in fact some of them were saying, why can't we carry on? Uh, yeah. But I said, no, no. You can just as soon as the light starts to shine, stop. And then what we would do is just sit around and some of them would go off and start singing their song. And I said, right, I'll sit down now. Now let's talk about the meanings of all of these. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why you had the three teachers. Mm. They all knew that thing, so that when the one get tired, the other one will come out and say, well, now, now that you've got the words, our role now is to teach you, is to, to explain to you what that song is all about, what it's trying to say. And I want you to own it. I want you to hold it in your heart. Mm. And I want you to translate it in your way, physically. I don't want you to follow me and say, this is how we do it. No, no, <laughs> you respond. And for you, did you see the Kapahaka team that mm. went from here? I did, yeah. That's exactly what awesome. I said to my team. Mm. Don't go down there and follow everybody else. No. Yeah. You go down there, I want you to learn the words first. Mm. And I want you to learn the, uh, the meaning and then the actions will come automatically yeah. your way, mm. not Nappi's way or not anybody else's way. Yeah. It's how you feel you want to express. And that's, that was the important part yeah. about it. Mm. And that's what needs to happen at our, at our Matawana. Mm. People need to not only learn the words, but they need to learn how, how to, to translate those words mm. into action. Yeah. Yeah, and then the words that they've learnt become meaningful. Mm. Then they can string a whole lot of words together to form good sentences. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But if you just teach them the words and then say, learn the words and that's it, this is roughly what it's saying, and that's it, well, they'll learn it and this minute it's gone. Yeah. The only place they'll sing it at is at, uh, maybe at a party. Yeah. <laughs> but the place you want them to sing it at is at places like Tangihangasa, mm. but they won't. Yeah. because they're not sure. Yeah. Ako Whakatele, which is the accelerated learning methodology which was adopted by the Wailanga late 80s, early 90s, was again a diversified approach um, which accelerated the learning of our people, which didn't force them to learn in a particular way, which may be reading and writing, mm. um, but actually catered for the learner who was not good at learning, uh, reading and writing, mm. but was good at speaking and listening. Yeah. And it's actually through that success of acquiring a knowledge through speaking and uh, talking talk, um, that they're acquiring some, some knowledge and acquiring a sense of achievement mm. that the enthusiasm then transfers to engaging in the writing and reading experience yeah. because of those experiences gained through mm. success, yeah. uh, through those other modes of learning. I suppose the Rungu Wetere School of Management, and having come through that myself, mm -hmm. was pretty much around just get in there and do it. Yeah. 
just get in there and do it. And having spent 12 years with him on his shoulder and, and working next to him through through the doing, learning by doing, Kopa, but I'm probably a product as you are, and many of us are in the one, mm. that we acquired our learning not by sitting in a corner mm. in terms of researching, reading, writing about stuff, but actually having the opportunity to do things, to make mistakes, but to have people there who would guide you through those mistakes mm. to ensure that there's a learning yeah. in those mistakes to support you in, in your work moving forward. So that sort of approach, um, I believe, was not only can be put through to Ako Whakatiri in an academic sense. Mm. But the people who, who founded Te Wānanga Aotearoa were pragmatic people, mm. who were practical, who were solutions oriented. Uh, the majority did not come from the educational um, industry. They came from farming, they came from uh, in agricultural fields, they came from um, insurance, um, and they came from a can-do let's get into it, number eight fence wire yeah. sort of attitude. Yeah. And hence the reason why the personality and the character mm -hmm. and the identity and the blood that actually runs through the veins of the one yeah. is uniquely different to any other tertiary institutions yeah. because of the attitude yeah. that the founders um, brought mm -hmm. to the table, so to speak, which in essence revolutionised yeah. the way that education at the tertiary level has been carried out today. Just want to take a leaf out of that fella Lozanov's book mm. in terms of accelerated learning, the suggestopedia, mm. and I know that the, the Wananga is very, mm. Wananga Waltio, mm. uh, is very conversant with, with that leading to accelerated learning, mm. etc. One of the things that Lozanov discovered was the hidden recesses mm. in the, the human mind. Mm. He picked this up. And of course, Lozanov used the suggestopedia and the rungo mo mo ya, mm, mm. the relaxation yeah. techniques, yeah. and the involvement of of the of the five senses, etc., mm. mm. to advance accelerated learning. Mm. The suggestion that, and, and I think that our, our tupuna knew this yeah. uh, because they used tones, mm. and we still we still do that to a certain extent today. Sometimes when I when I get up to Fai mm -hmm. I will use a certain tone that resonates in the fari. Mm -hmm. And uh, Auntie Ina Te Wira mm -hmm. was one lady who used certain tones in her karana. And I think it's um, because the tone hits a, a certain pitch, yeah. uh, something resonates in you. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And you can feel, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. and there's lots of karanga where you feel it's yeah. Yeah. But Auntie Ina used to search I mean, I remember Auntie Nucky mentioning this also, mm -hmm. but um, she would search for that pitch in her karanga, which would which would make that that other something quiver, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Not just the the hairs on the back of your neck, yeah. but there's something else that she'd try to hit with her pitch, okay. even if her uh, karanga was not loud, mm -hmm. she'd still hit that pitch, and people would shudder with it. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. Now, in measuring of the brain waves, you've got alpha, beta, delta, gamma, and theta. They're waves. waves yeah. And uh, alpha is what we're operating in now. Yep. And it's uh, sort of above 12 yeah. cycles per second. And then there's beta, which is between 7 and 10, and then below 7, below 4. And then when you're in theta, well, you're in another world. It's, it's just a, and you can use certain sounds mm. to access those, and I think that our taonga pūru, yeah. you know, you hear the, the pūru dere mm. mm. and you mm, and, mm. and you're sent into another world almost. Mm. Thing. Mm. I think that the kalakia that our uh, our people used in the the most tapu of knowledges, mm. right, mm. accessed those hidden recesses of the mind. Yeah. I remember one of the uh, accorded or from Uncle Dave Manihera, you know, when you have something that to you is, is precious, precious. Mm. and you, you would put it almost, you know, in the category of tapu, mm. then you go, you take it to a spot where you've got quiet and peace and mm. you, which is all conducive to your learning. I think in present day environments, 
we need to create those atmospheres. Um, they're not necessarily at hand as they used to be um, and we don't often um, give ourselves that opportunity. Um, but I think we're making progress. Yeah. Just um, coming back to Waiata, and especially our, our ones that <coughs> were like the um, Maramataka, um, how were these traditionally taught? Because we hear that sometimes, By ear. Yeah, sometimes that they, they would be singing them in, in Moiana Ngā Tangata, Engari, yes. Pakarongotoni. Well, and again, as I said, I can remember my father, you know, trying to learn them sort of early, early in the morning, sort of latish at night, but early in the morning, mm -hmm. very early, you know, te te and mm -hmm. that means, you know, just before daybreak, mm -hmm. you know, because I suppose as you get older, you know, you get up earlier. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'm getting to that stage now. <laughs> and so, yeah, you have time, and I think the mind has had a break. Yeah and had a, has had its rest for the night. Um, you see studies now nowadays on how uh, how the brain works and all that. Yes. I think our ancestors and, and everyone <coughs> back then too must have known, you know, when was the most appropriate time to learn. Oh, well, well yeah. I think so. Yeah. I mean, you know, as I said, you know, my grandmother used to always get up early and yeah. you know, trying to get us up at that time mm. of the morning, but uh, they did get up early and, you know, to me, naturally that was possibly the time, yeah. I, you know, I, I've always thought that was possibly the time when they learned, yeah. learned a lot, because if your mind settled, I mean, people, people have always said mm. that the morning is the best time to learn, because your mind is fresh, yeah. whereas in the afternoon you doze off. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's been tested on students and yeah. you find it, you know, very relevant. Yeah. You know, so you've had enough had of the, the drone and so you <laughs> sort of, you know. Yeah, so they knew all that way back then. All those well, I think ways. they knew a lot of things way back then and, you know, to me, uh, what, is, what is going on now has just been repackaged in different form. Mm -hmm. um, psychologically, mm. they knew how to treat people to bring the best out of them. If we talk about the word accelerated, it means speeding things up. When you consider that the ancient Māori, the Māori of the 1800s, you could not even compare them in terms of what we do today. There was no need to accelerate, was there, really? Because they had all the time in the world to do it. But it was not so much about accelerated learning as about uh, in-depth and accumulation of that, that information and knowledge and correctness and being able to become the repository to pass that knowledge on. What I can say is that that method, the method that I'm just referring to which possibly I acquired by default, has a deeper impact uh, than the type of learning that I went through at school, uh, meaning rote learning and, and homework. And, and so perhaps we can learn something from the, method of, the methodology of Māori learning of the past. To conclude our kōrero this morning, I would like to read um, something that I've written about learning. Um, excuse me if I read it from the paper, but I think it can be of benefit to all those who are watching and listening. Learning is a lifelong pursuit and experience. And at the beginning, the tawira or student symbolically swallows hukatai, the white stone, indicating that he was entering upon a search for knowledge or matauranga. Hukatai, the sea foam, and rehutai, the sea spray, those which were brought down by Tafaki when he 
brought the three baskets of knowledge, are metaphors taken from a canoe on passing, on passage on the sea. Hukatai the sea foam or the wake generated by the canoe in motion symbolizes a pursuit of knowledge as an accumulation of facts picked up along the way. Rehutai, the red stone, depicts a canoe heading into the sunrise. And as the sea foam is thrown up by the bow of the canoe, the rays of the sun piercing the foam create a rainbow effect as you peer through it. Now, when the Tawira has acquired knowledge, he then swallows symbolically Rehutai, the red stone. And by meditation in the heart and the student touching his own center, illumination becomes clearer. Knowledge is then transformed into wisdom. This is a spiritual experience. Kia ora. Nalida kei te mihe tura ki a koutou e hopu nei i ngā kupu kōrero. Hei whakatā mana wā i a tātou katoa te iwi Māori, ngā tānga te anima i tātou. Hei whakakokoi i te hena ngaro. Hei whakakaha i te mana wā. Ana hei whakaputa hoki i te weiduetanga o te ao Māori me tōna reo.